Aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Wahei. Here we are, another week and another interesting guest. With us this afternoon, I have Kaeo Kealoha Lindsay, right? And he is the, uh, I guess, the senior aide, the uh, chief of staff. Yeah, you could say the that. Domo, you know, the <laughs> honcho for uh, Representative Gene Ward yep. and in the Hawaii State Legislature. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Kaeo. We have an exciting program for all of you today, and Kaeo is going to help talk me through. And the name of our program today is Broken Promises, the DHHL story. Now, most of us, all or many of us that, that are Native Hawaiians, have over the years um, been disappointed. I, I would use the word disappointed with uh, the progress that uh, Prince Kuhio's legacy is made for its people. Prince Kuhio, as you know, as, as we all know, uh, started the Hawaiian Homes Program in the state of Hawaii for the um, betterment of Native Hawaiians. Now, uh, but about, I'd say about two years ago, would it be about two years ago? Yeah. Yeah, just a little background. For two years ago, I got a pamphlet from your, your boss, Gene Ward, and it was called Broken Promises. And it was a really a listing of the problems of the uh, Hawaiian Homestead Program. And so it obviously piqued my interest for a number of reasons. But um, before we begin, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be Kale. here. And uh, I thought I gave that a little longer introduction than normal. <laughs> but I'm, I'm so interested in your initiative. Uh, for several, for a number of different reasons. But uh, first of all, tell us about how this all got started. Why, you know, why would Gene Ward, who is actually the minority leader, isn't he? Yep. The minority leader in a Senate, I mean, in a House of Representatives, in a legislature totally dom dominated by Democrats, reach out and take on this particular subject? I mean, how did it all begin? I guess we can start uh, with a little bit of background on Rep Ward. He was um, a Peace Corps volunteer, I think, in the late 60s, and then later on was a country director um, in East Timor. And in between that time, uh, he got his PhD uh, from the East-West Center, and it was on Native Hawaiians in business. And so right. his partner was uh, Dr. George Kanahele. He always, a very famous... Yes. Uh, Icon, really, mm -hmm. in the Hawaiian community. Yeah, and he always says, you know, he was about 10 feet away when uh, Dr. Kanahele was writing Kukanaka. Wow. So the, the Native Hawaiian issues uh, has always been, I think, near and dear to him just with his interest in sort of indigenous affairs and, you know, international affairs as well. And so... But he also seemed to have begun this initiative when he hired uh, a, a uh, Kaeo Kealoha <laughs> Lindsay. I mean, you know, don't, I, I, don't you think there's some relationship to that? What's funny is I actually, um, so he started doing, we interviewed um, 18 people for the study, and he started the interview process actually a year before I started with him. Okay. And so come uh, beginning of 2018, uh, I come on board, and it just so happens that that issue comes up. And for those of you who don't know, Prince Kuhio was also the Republican delegate to Congress, Congress from Hawaii. Congress, in fact, he was, yeah, the major uh, Republican. Um, you, what, what a lot of people don't know is Prince Kuhio actually kicked up the whole, whole idea of the Republican Party, made it very popular with, uh, with uh, people. But his brother, David, right. one in the core, was actually the founder of the Democratic Party. I know, yeah. So this is a real family affair in Hawaii. Okay, let's get to Hawaiian Homes. Kuhio establishes the Hawaiian Homes program. Uh, Representative Ward uh, actually began before you got on with this study. Now, mm -hmm. he interviewed a cross-section of people. I, I, right here on this brochure, there is uh, six, 18, at least 18 of the people that were interviewed. And this is just a cross section of Hawaii. This is not; these are not the standard bearers <laughs> of the Republican Party. I mean, no. they, some of them are. Some of them are very prominent Republicans, but most of them are business people and a pretty good cross section of Hawaii. Right, and it was 
the intention behind it was to sort of get a fact-finding study. You know, we didn't want this to be a partisan piece one way or another. We're not laying blame towards any one person, any administration for what happened with the program. And so what Rep. Ward did is he had his staff um, at the time interview, you know, various OHA trustees, I think most of the living former directors, and even the current uh, director and deputy director of DHHL. Um, he interviewed them on the condition of anonymity. You know, we didn't want any personalities or anything uh, to come out just to allow them to be candid about the program, the department, and, and their tenure. Um, and so, and, and there's even develop, there's developers, OHA trustees, just to get a holistic picture of DHHL, uh, what went wrong, and then what, what can be done in the future. And so so what, what were the problems that this study identified? And, uh, w you know, what, what was, were some of the proposed solutions? Sure. Uh, one of the biggest things was, obviously, you know, the, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has 203,000 acres of land. Um, and it always seems like there's never enough money to, to build on those projects. And so, you know, with 27,000 people on the wait list, and I believe there's um, 30, about 33,000 um, potential applicants who would qualify who haven't yet, um, well, that's a lot of uh, people. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, uh, before we get on with the, this, the, our main subject, uh, you know, I, I, that statistic is in some, in some respects actually uh, kind of uplifting in the sense that 33,000 half Hawaiians or more in this day and age is uh, almost uh, un was almost unbelievable back in 1920. I mean, right. 1920, people expected Native Hawaiians eventually to uh, not be around, at least not, right. not anybody with, with half, half blood or, or more. And so we have 21,000, you say? 27. 27,000 on the waiting list, mm -hmm. 33,000 additional potential. Potential applicants who haven't applied So that's yet. like what? That's like almost 60,000 people uh -huh. who are half Hawaiian or better. We really need this program. And, right. uh, and the good part, the good news is the population is growing. The bad news is the population is growing. Right. So how do we do it? So what are, I'm sorry to have interrupt you, but what are some of the problems? Sure. So what, the main one is, you know, land rich, cash poor. And so, you know, there's never enough funding, I believe, um, in a recent request from the department for a federal grant. Um, I believe if they were trying to house every person on the wait list um, with an average of $350,000 to build a turnkey home, what they would need is about $10.5 billion dollars Ten and to and just billion. fund them, yeah. Wow. And that's assuming we can even get that much from the federal, and then not counting any sort of repairs to infrastructure. I think that was an additional four hundred and fifty million. And so we have, you know, this big problem, and it seems like there's never enough time or never enough money to house these folks. But um, is there enough land? There's definitely enough land. Okay. Um, the DHHL land typically isn't, from my understanding, the best, you know, land for residences but but it's available and um, just to be able to get more money into the program and and, and manage it um, a little better would would help us to at least chip away on that okay problem. so the number one program uh, problem appears to have been not just not enough resources to carry out its mission mm -hmm. uh, were there any others that you might have identified I guess management over yeah. the years there's been some uh, problems with management. How about prioritization? Did the state always prioritize this program like it ought to? I don't think so, especially re obviously with the Nelson case. I believe in 2012 is when they started that. And it got to a point where beneficiaries had to sue the state just to get what they believed was sufficient funding to keep the lights on. And eventually they came up with the figure, I believe it was 21 or 28 million just for operating costs. Okay. And the state appealed and so, you know, you're still kind of in that cycle of, okay, we have this program. It's been around for over 100 years. Uh, the responsibility was transferred to the state uh, in 1959. But we still haven't been able to, you know, really put this as a priority. And I, I believe even uh, last year, the gov Governor Ige had mentioned that this was the most money appropriated to DHHL for administrative costs. 
And oh, so wow. given all of that time that we've had the program in 2018 is where we've reached. Okay, so peak. now you find out that and the, 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 the critical issue is resources. Mm -hmm. And so what happens next? I mean, you have the study. It identifies this. It points out the deficiencies of the program. And it's got a great title, by the way, because it is a <laughs> promise. Uh, that, and it's got a great picture of Kuhio. So if you folks ever see this lying around, take advantage of it. It's an, actually a very easy read. I mm -hmm. mean, it's made so that it can be quickly, uh, uh, quickly read and, um, you know, and uh, convey information. So anyway, you, you have this. What happened next? I mean, what's the next step? So in addition to the, the written study, we also last year hired... Um, a videographer to sort of encapsulate uh, these ideas into a, a film. So there's an eight minute short film and a 26 minute documentary featuring um, former trustee Oz Stender, trustee Peter Apo, and um, Mr. Peter Savio of Savio Realty, uh, in addition to Rep Ward. And so it just sort of gave the overview of, you know, the problem, uh, the history, and then solutions. Okay, so um, we're going to get back into the solutions in, in, in a little while. But, uh, you know, so you do this video, you do all of this. I mean, do you take it out to the community? What, what yeah, happened? and so uh, once the video was finished, we waited until July 9th, uh, 2018, to debut the film uh, and the written study. And so the, July 9th was when the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act was passed um, as amended in 1921. And so we wanted to, that to be sort of a symbolic um, release. Uh, we had a lot of OHA trustees show up. Um, even Bumpy Conaheli was there. Oh, really? Great, um, great. And so after the showing of the film, um, you know, we were grateful enough to have a full big conference room in the Capitol uh, full of people to watch the movie um, and just have a discussion afterward. You know, what, what can be done next? What can, what can the... the people who are involved and who want to be involved take actionable steps forward to, you know, fulfill yeah, the Yeah, because obviously the this was, this study wasn't done just to add another study to the stack of studies right. and, about government. You right, know, and, right. Because, so I understand uh, that this was, uh, was actually done as an action piece. Mm -hmm. That it was, uh, you know, from, from this effort, uh, something hopefully good would happen, right? Right. So you named three people, Oz Stender, who was a former Bishop of State trustee or mm -hmm. Kamehameha Schools trustee, who's a former OHA trustee, yeah. and uh, actually pretty uh, long-time advocate of Hawaiian issues in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Peter Apo. Yep. Peter Apo, who was OHA trustee mm -hmm. for ma many years, and also uh, pretty much a Hawaiian activist. But you also mentioned Peter Savio. <laughs> now, what has Savio got to do with any of this stuff? What's, what's interesting, there I guess two things about Mr. Savio. Uh, on the one hand, he is the biggest um, private affordable housing provider in the state. He doesn't take any state funds. He always goes above and beyond to help his tenants to move into home ownership. Obviously, we're stuck in a rental so cycle. He, he's, not, he's, not, he's not funded by any government funds? or, or No. So? No, so he, what he does is he, like I said, goes above and beyond with his tenants. He'll sort of create a, a kind of a profit sharing program to help his tenants save up for a down payment. And he's also very, very passionate about Hawaiian issues. Um, in the movie, one of the things he says is that his mom comes home. Uh, she was also a realtor, very frustrated because she had, uh, you know, was trying to close on a native Hawaiian client. And... He didn't want to buy because he was waiting for a lease oh, from the oh, DHHL. Oh. Yeah. And at he the never time, got the lease. Huh? Yeah. And at the time, you couldn't have own property while also be on the wait list. Yeah, my dad was in the same position. Oh, really? Yeah. I grew up on the homestead. Did you, by the way, are you homesteader? By no, no, no. Okay. I grew up on the, in uh, Kamuela. Oh, wow. Well, they call it Kamuela now. It's actually <laughs> Waimea. We refer to it as Waimea on the big island. And... Um, he had that same situation. He could not get a Hawaiian homestead uh, until he actually got rid of any property that he owned. And he happened to have inherited a small oh, piece uh, wow. from, his, from my grandfather, which he actually had to sell. And, and then he got a house lot in uh, Kamuela. 
It, it was a very trying time. A lot of people were in that situation. So Savio experienced something firsthand. He did, and, and I guess the kicker to this point is when she had come, his mom had come home frustrated, he asked her why, you know, what was going on, she couldn't close on the client. And she had met with, uh, he can't remember who exactly, a politician, a banker, someone. And he had told her, you know, don't rock the boat. This is intentional. We, know, we don't want this to succeed. And, and that, I think, has been something that's been sort of driving him um, and having worked with him over, you know, the past seven okay. months since the debut, he, he really does have a heart for... The well, world. I tell you what, we, we want to come back and the second half of our show, folks, will be about the solutions that people like Apo and Oz Stender and uh, Peter Savio and I guess many others uh, put out there. And so we will take a short break right now and we'll, write, we'll be right back to some of the solutions for fixing broken promises. Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming. Salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'i and our guest this afternoon, Ka'eo Ke Aloha Lindsay. What a fantastic Hawaiian name. That's about Thank every you. dynasty that's <laughs> still around. But anyway, we're talking about the Hawaiian Homes Program and uh, uh, an initiative that was started uh, in uh, Gene, Representative Gene Ward's office called uh, Broken Promises, and that, which is really a story of the Hawaiian Homes Act. Uh, we're going to start talking about solutions in a few minutes, but I thought that for... Just for general information, people ought to know some of the very important dates and why the Hawaiian Homes Program uh, is where it is today, in a sense. Um, so tell us a little bit about it, just a little bit about the history. You know, we're like, uh, I, we all know that in, um, it's, Prince Kuhio started it in 1920. Mm -hmm. But there's also been a lot of things that have happened in the modern era, so... Uh, go, go and, you know, let the, just tell us, uh, give us some of these important. Sure, sure. So um, after it was passed in 21, Kuhio actually died um, a, a year after it was passed. Yeah. And so normally, which we, what we learned from Robin Danner recently is that once, you know, usually when federal laws are passed, there's administrative rules that also accompany those. Because he had died and didn't have the opportunity to oversee what went on with the program, those rules never came into effect. Whoa. And so we went you know, from 1921 up until 1959, when it was previously run by the commission, and then there was a mutual agreement between state and federal government, where the state then governs the trust. So that 1959 is very important because it's the statehood. Yeah. So I have heard it said, and, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that actually, one of the conditions of Hawaii statehood Correct. was that they would undertake the trust responsibility for implementing this act. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, our existence depends on carrying out this trust. Is this like an exaggeration or is it? No, it was actually incorporated into the Statehood Act that Hawaii or the state of Hawaii would manage the trust. Okay. And uh, the next important day, which I'm sure that you could speak to, um, was that Funding for DHHL became mandatory 
at the 1978 uh, Constitutional Convention. Okay. And, um, you know, from there, uh, there's just kind of a little bit of gap in the document, and then, you know, that's when the Nelson case starts in 2007. Which comes out of the CONCON. Yeah. And what the Nelson case uh, basically said was that the Hawaii state constitution requires adequate support, mm -hmm. uh, at least, in, well, for, for four different reasons. But the case itself was about whether the, the program was receiving adequate support for its administrative costs. Mm -hmm. The idea being that the more money you spend on administration, the less you can use to build houses. So that takes us right yeah. into where we are exactly. now. What's the solution? What's the solution? So one of the biggest things that came out of it, I guess a little bit more background. So after the, the film started or was debuted, um, we sort of solicited volunteers to say, hey, we're going to have a working group. We're going to kind of come together, blank slate, let's see what kind of solutions can come forward from here. And so we had, you know, a few of the people that were in the interviews, uh, Trustee Apo, uh, Trustee Stender was the chair of the group. And we just had maybe about five or six meetings uh, in the last half of the year just to talk about what they want. And so one of the things, there were three priorities that came out of it. One of them was financing, uh, which I'll get into a little later. Uh, the second one was housing products. You know, some Hawaiians want to live off the grid. Some want, you know, upuna housing or you know, community centers. L less of just the brick and mortar turnkey right, type of right, housing. Right. And the third was the quantum issue. Obviously, um, you know, we do have those thirty-two thousand potential applicants, but Kuhia wanted one thirty-second when the act was originally passed, and they had to, you know, come with a political compromise of one half. And so dealing with that issue long term is going to be something we're going to have to so face. The, the financing mm -hmm. type of home. Wow, you, that's the spectrum and the blood quantum. Yeah. So you took on all of them. Yeah, and, and we just you know, kind of shot ideas back and forth of what, what could the Hawaiian Homes Program look like in the 21st century. And, and one of the biggest things, uh, biggest solutions was leveraging the land assets. And so that came within, I guess, a little subcommittee within financing of when you say leveraging the land assets, what are you talking about? Uh, specifically referring to the lease. So you get, obviously, a beneficiary receives a lease and has to pay a dollar for it. However, there are a lot of Native Hawaiians, I don't know the percentage offhand, but once they get the lease, they don't have the financial means to, for a down payment to either build their home or to buy it. And so that... That means that, that, uh, that uh, in the past was handled like by a special program depending mm -hmm. on the funds available mm -hmm. from the department. Right. So th what you were looking for is a way to get private sector money into buying into the hands of Native Hawaiian homesteaders? In, in effect, yeah. And it's what we came to is using the system that's already there and with specifically referring to the lease. Um, Mr. Savio always say that if you look at a DHHL lease and compare that to a modern lease, uh, Bishop Estate, Queen Lilio Kalani, the formatting is very different and, and it's an, an older lease. And so there are a limited number of programs that a DHHL beneficiary can go to. I believe it's uh, FHA and uh, the USDA. So right now, the uh, uh, beneficiary can borrow money but because of the structure of the lease their financing is not as readily available as if the lease came from Kamehameha schools you can finance but the problem all is mainly a, a down payment and, and just the the hardest time you know a lot of we all know how expensive it is to live over right. here to have you know anywhere from 20 to 50 thousand dollars right off hand to pay put a down payment on a mortgage is often not really realistic for a lot of Native Hawaiians, unfortunately. And so what the main part is let, using the lease and the value that comes with that land. So for example, you get a lot in Kapolei. Uh, it's valued at maybe $200,000 for the land itself. You, a beneficiary cannot use that value if it wants to go to sort of a ma more mainstream federal lender, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, But what about the fact that the Hawaiian homelands can't be alienated? And so what that, well, what that would happen if you, you know, were to foreclose, um, that what we're proposing is the lender will have to sell to someone either on the wait list or 
Which, uh, by the way, is what happens now. I mean, I, I just want to get that point real clear because some people may think that this initiative is a, is a way of selling off Hawaiian assets. I want to get real clear yeah. that right now, if you do everything conventional, the way that it is uh, in existence, uh, and, but you can't do your payments and it's foreclosed on by the department or by, uh, you know, as the landowner, mm -hmm. that th that land goes out to, uh, for purchase to another home, homestead qualified recipient. Mm -hmm. So this is not really anything that is different. It, is it? No, no. And, and, you know, a, a lot of, it was a little controversial coming out with it um, because I think there is fear that, that we would privatize the trust. And that right. has never been One the of issue, the never the intent, never, you know. So this is a way of expanding the options, not changing the uh, ultimate ownership of the property. They will still be trust property. Absolutely. And so it's, it's just allowing a Native Hawaiian beneficiary to use the value of the lease to help them with. I tell you one payment. of the things they ought to consider, which I, I heard, is the fact that we still pay only a dollar a year. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. at least in, it should be uh, if we just took the inflation, right. at, least, uh, at least 20 bucks. I, 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 I would say that if you can pay $100 a year mm -hmm. for something that is yours for 199 years, right. um, that's, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty fair. But yeah. that's just me, you know, I, I think that. I want to move on, though, because I don't want to kick kill all the time on this thing. Types of housing. Yeah. Types of housing. The, the department have all, has always taken the traditional uh, view that, uh, you know, what the homestead meant, a house and a huge lot mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, or a farm or... What, is there any uh, traction to the idea of modernizing the types and the uses of property? We're, we're hoping so. Uh, obviously, the, the 1921 Act was created where our economy was very agriculturally centered. And so it, it would only make sense for someone to have a homestead at that time. Um, you know, a lower population as well. So what are you looking at? Uh, senior housing, apartments, all, uh, the, the spectrum? Yeah, all of the above. What uh, would it take to, to, to change this, to make that spectrum available? I think uh, an issue, at least for, particularly with off-the-grid housing, you know, we've also heard ideas of, hey, just, gi just give me the land. I'll, yeah, it's tried uh, before and, and didn't always work. But sometimes it did. Though. Right, and so there's some problems with county zoning and, you know, infrastructure there. If we say that, hey, I don't want any city and county, you know, plumbing or anything like that, then they also won't, you know, pick up your trash or do anything. Yeah, well, I, don't wanna, I don't want Hawaiian Electric to be sending me a bill. Right, That's right. a big one. Anyway, um, I know we're out of time. I'm going to leave the idea of the blood quantum for another show. <laughs> right. Because that will probably take up a couple of shows. But, I, you know, congratulations on trying to get the program modernized. I know that you're at the legislature and dealing uh, with the executive branch, with the governor's office and mm -hmm. the rest, to at least acquaint them with all of these solutions. And, uh, you know, I think it's wonderful to see such a bipartisan effort being led by the minority leader of the whole House of Representatives. And if he ever wants to come on this show and, and, <laughs> and take credit personally, uh, we are glad to have him. Absolutely. It. Folks, thank you so much for joining us, and I heard, I hope you learned a little something about a pamphlet called Broken Promises, which is talking about the Department of Hawaiian Homeland story. Aloha.